to say anything right or wrong. Or it's just your impression. What um, could you start by saying your name for me? I'm Mahmoud El Qadi. And what have you seen changed in the last twenty years in the civil rights movement? A lot and a little. That's not a trick question. Both things are true. Um, a lot in the way of some adjustments that have been made as a result of uh, some, a powerful, morally outraged social movement, commonly called the Civil Rights Movement, which I call a movement for democracy. It's always been that. I think it's misnamed. It's the movement to to, to bring democracy into fruition insofar as that's possible from where it's been, to bring it out of the abstract into reality, to bring it out of the word into action and being, and I would argue that this struggle has been going on since 1787, and it's largely viewed as a legal struggle, but I think it goes beyond that. But first you have to get to the legal because that's what we call it, a civil rights question the Civil Rights Movement is nothing more or less, in, in my view, than an extension of the Civil War without standing on this. It's, it's the same question, I mean, in a different phase. It's the Civil War, make no mistake, without armies. People still die, not in massive numbers, as a result of the conflict between uh, social, for social justice, with the end what we are pleased to call a democracy, the democratic creed, or the representative form of government, which we call the republicanism, not small r, not the Republican Party. <laughs> but republicanism is the form of representative government, which Americans, uh, to the extent that they can, practice that. You can't always uh, as witness what happened in the 2000 election. <laughs> I mean, it was a tremendous uh, setback for republicanism, small r that people were not represented as they're supposed to be. So I think that, you know, you ask the last 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, it doesn't matter. You know, it's arbitrary whether you said, you could have said 40 years, I would have said the same thing, is that a lot has changed, has changed, and, and that very little has changed. What has changed is broad and, and, and superficial. Uh, it it's, has to do with uh, fighting from an African people's standpoint, the meanest aspects of white supremacy, of racism, segregation, and Jim Crow, all that adds up to uh, oppression for me, the oppression of, 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 of African people. Not done anything as far as I know to anybody <laughs> uh, uh, by the American established orders. You know, I'm not talking about white people, like I'm demonizing white people. I know a little better than that, you know, uh, that, you know, black people are fighting principalities and powers. The same thing the Bible cites, power structure, oppressors. They're known by many other names, communists, you know, you can, you can call them dictators, or you can call them the American government, the founding fathers, whom I call our original oppressors, uh, the original racists, or all of them were most of them were, and they put that in writing, <laughs> law. That's why Americans are as they are. This is a part of our heritage, is racism, is white supremacy, is the um, oppression of black people, which leads to degradation, uh, which leads to all kinds of humiliations and the deform deformations of the human personality. That's what's happened. Uh, it's all there for the world to see, God sees it, if the world doesn't see it, <laughs> that that's what this is about, first and foremost. And so African people, after, who had never not struck for their freedom in this country uh, from the time of enslavement, you know, that's 250 years almost of unrequited labor and then the extension of slavery into something called segregation slash Jim Crow slash apartheid, whatever you want to call it, it's a condition of unfreedom. The African-American people in this country are not now, nor have they ever been free. The way you define the people as free is whether they control their identity or their destiny. We do not have much.
much to say about that. Other people do that for us. Uh, not in our interest, but do it for us. And so uh, the Civil Rights Movement did this for democracy. Uh, it opened Pandora's box. Once World War II had ended and America was at a different um, status in relationship to world power, the United Nations had emerged, other countries had surfaced on the scene. When the United Nations came into being, there were about 30 nations, 40 nations at the most. Now there are over 100 that came into being. And most of those people are not Europeans, not Christians, not communists, nor are they in so-called white people. That's a part of it. That's external. Internally, the pressure from the outside, the communist movement, speaking objectively, not I, I don't favor communism any more than I do Republicans or Democrats. You know, I don't. So the point is that, that they put pressure on this country in the international community by pointing to black people's struggle in America. That's what the communists did for black struggle. Now I'm not saying that they were on our side necessarily, they were doing it out of their interest. And I'm like Frederick Douglass. I'll go and lead with the devil and fight against slavery. That's the way I feel about racism, white supremacy. I agree with anybody who wants to get down with that in terms of trying to help destroy that, I'm with them. I'm not going to deal with any questions. Morally, I think that's right to be against the devil. I don't mean devil as in supernatural. I'm talking about human beings. You know, their behavior is devilish, and so you should be against it. Uh, any human being should be against that. And so I line up with anybody who say, look, let's destroy this. It has dehumanized human being. It's brought, in the words of Dr. King, so much unearned suffering in the name of white supremacy. So we must destroy it. Oh, I didn't say wait for it to go away. Fight against it. Because it not only does it, 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 it demeans and debases black people, whites don't seem to know that it debases them. They don't seem to know. And so we need to get rid of it, you know, and anybody, uh, so I don't care about people labels and stuff like that. You know why? And people say, well, you sound communist or social. I could care less. Look who might be calling me that, Strom Thurmond. <laughs> you know what I mean? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Um, so we, the, the black people in this country, has done a lot for democracy. They never gave up. They kept fighting for civil rights, beginning in 1909 with the NAACP to gain the rights that we once had in the 19, uh, late 19th century, you know, where we had supposedly rights according to the Constitution, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. We were free from slavery. We were citizens. had a right to vote. That lasted a minute. And we were still back in the condition of, of slavery. The same people were in charge, the same people who wrote the Constitution, Southern White supremacists, that's what they were. Jefferson, Washington, Madison, uh, Monroe, Jackson were all white supremacists. They were all slave owners. They were all agrarian capitalists. That's what they were. You can talk about all this other virtuous stuff. And they were people who were surveyors and built University of Virginia. But they were all some, something else. And that was more important to them. The business of slavery and what it represented in terms of their power. It's no accident that four of the first five presidents were slave owners. It's no accident that eight out of the first 12 were, were slave owners. It's no accident that, that, that 12 out of the first uh, 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 twenty two for 12 out of the first 18 were slave owners. Do you know that a quarter, 25% of all the pe people who sat in the presidency, who held the office of presidency, were slave owners. <laughs> and that's no accident. Slave, ownership of slaves represented power. And that's, and I would refer anybody who looks at this, please pick up Gary Wills' book on Negro President Thomas Jefferson and the slave power. He's a daring white American historian to reveal and to discuss try to raise the question about what really, really happened. Well, we're a part of that. You can't extract that from American history, although we try and say slavery happened a long time ago and this is where we are now, have nothing to do with the past, and if black people raise the question, they are, what do you call it, um, they're whining or they're, um, you know, 
<clears throat> using the race card. I think, let me say this parenthetically, that is the most absurd and obscene thing I can think of. Go for the mouths of many white people and accusing black people of raising the race card. Well, they invented race, the idea, all the laws, the policies. What race card have black people raised? They can't get out of racism. They're race ridden. You, you know, you can't talk outside of a racist language. Because Jefferson and Washington and all the writers and pseudo-scientists and historians created racism, created race. Now you accuse the victim because he tries to, Malcolm X had a saying for that. He said, you know, when a man is trying to hang me, you know, he's got a rope trying to hang me because I struggle against it, because I resist, he accused me of trying to hang him. This is what, how crazy this country is. It's just insane. Uh, for a white person to accuse black people of playing the race card. White people are the race card. I don't mean all the white people as it's some kind of biological crazy stuff about race, but I'm talking about politics and power and Machiavelli, you know. That's what I'm talking about. They use race to deceive people, to distort, to depress them, oppress them, anything that they can think of to keep this question from being risen. I might add, again, people ought to read some, some white historians are coming out now. Uh, 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 Joseph Ellis has a wonderful chapter in his book called Silence. It's still going on where you couldn't even discuss slavery like you can discuss racism today. I was astounded that an American historian would raise that question. Does it much more better than I could ever try to do that? I mean, to say, look, this is what the question is. There's a conspiracy of silence over the question of slavery. There's a conspiracy of silence since the fall of, uh, fall of um, Reconstruction, where the Southerners took over. This One of the problems in America for black people is the country has always been run by white supremacists, most of its existence, from 1787 to 1865. It was one run by white supremacists. Most of the presidents were, 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 were slave owners. In fact, the only two-term presidents up until the Civil War were slave owners, don't you see? And then there was a brief thing with Lincoln and, and couple of other people up until the Republican sellout in 1876, you know, with the Rutherford B. Hayes. He was a Republican and, and, and resuppressed black people, turned us back over to these brutes who ran the South. And we endured all kinds of suffering, which nobody knows a thing about, lynching every two and a half days between 1880 and 1900. That's how many people died. Read Graf Ginsburg 100 years of lynching. It's all there. Okay. The point I'm trying, people don't want to hear this. See, but this is what I want to say. You ask me the question. This is what I think. What has happened? I'm explaining what has happened so I can get to what has changed. What has changed is the country has been somewhat reformed by the civil rights movement. Nothing else. I want to hear. <laughs> Nothing else. It's a civil rights movement. It's black people suing in the courts until finally the court in 1954 decided that it was politically expedient to get rid of the, this, this unnecessary aspect of racism about you know the abuse and segregation and disrespect for black people, not because they suddenly saw black people as good human beings and so forth, but because of the communism, because of what was happening in the third world, because Africa and Asia were getting free. Now, how are you going to tell the world that you're a democratic country that you are non-racist and that you're all of these good things, and you've got a segment of people in your country that you are intentionally, consciously abusing by law. How are you going to tell a Nigerian who you want to sell refrigerators to <laughs> that you know you like him when you don't like me? You know, it was just common sense. So I consider the Supreme Court decision a political decision. It's got nothing to do with anything. Else not moral, political. It made sense for them to do that at that time. Why not 1944? You know, in 1945, when a million black people, you know, who participated in that war again, on various, as, you know, soldiers and laborers and so forth. So the, the point is that the civil rights movement found the key to Pandora's box and opened it, and now we have all that we have in terms of movements, women's rights, which was a dead issue since, since the passage of the 19th Amendment. A dead issue. There was no, sure there were 
women, like, you know, when, when nobody even knows Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote her book in, in 1952. And it's, it's the greatest thing on, I think, next to, next to John Stewart's male uh, e e uh, um, equality of the sexes in the late 19th century. A male wrote the most radical book on, on, on women's rights. But it wasn't even an issue. And you know, it became an issue in 1964 when that ugly man, Senator Smith, Howard Smith, from Virginia, was filibustering against the 64 Civil Rights Act, and he was looking for something to say. And he said, the next thing, you know, you'll be talking about women's rights. And uh, white women, at least were smart enough to figure, ah, there's a window of opportunity. Boom! We're on it. We're on the docket. <laughs> now we can raise the question that's been suppressed since 1920. So I think the civil rights movement, black people, are responsible for reviving the women's rights movement. I wish there were enough white women in this country to acknowledge that. Then we can get some. I, mean, I think that the country's advancing in terms of human relations. But people act like they don't see that connection. You know, almost all the women leaders of the early stages of the women's rights movement in this era came out of the civil rights movement. Gloria Steinem, every one of them, were politicized by black people. White youth, the more progressive arm of white youth, got involved in politics, which led to their becoming leaders in the Vietnam War, largely youth-led, largely. Sam Brown was in the Mississippi Summer Project. That's where he got his education. So I think that black people are owed a great deal of thanks <laughs> by all these movements. They raise the identity question, which nobody, everybody's American, nonsense. Black people raised the question, the partisan, uh, what, with respect to their identity as Negroes. No Negroes never left Africa. They're not in Africa now, they weren't in Africa then, so how did we become Negroes? <laughs> people label us to dehumanize us and separate us from the historical process that is of human beings in the world. You can't reference Negroes from history, you can reference Africans <laughs> and black people. We're not the only black people in the world. And there were black people, so we are black, black other people in Africa, in the South Pacific, in Central and South America. We're, we're black people, so what? Uh, nobody should be ashamed of that. People are not ashamed of being white. I know damn well I'm not gonna be ashamed of being black. <laughs> so they made that discovery and transformed this country. It's still going on. This, this country is still involved in an identity crisis. The jury is still out as to what an American really is. Because black people raise the question, I am not a Negro. That's a nice Spanish word, which means dark skin or whatever you want to say, that approximates black. So we speak English here and don't use the subterfuge of a foreign language to say what you can say in English. Say black. And we're black and proud. And that happened in a 10 year span. I obviously think that's the greatest thing that happened to the black psyche in 10 years. In 1960, you were Negroes. In 1970, you were black people and proud black people. It's still going on with the African-American stuff. It's still going on. I contend that black people will eventually call themselves black Americans, Africans. That's good. That's healthy for people to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Job in the Bible says you must ask the question, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I bound? over and over again. That's what human beings should ask themselves. So now we have Native Americans. They're no longer Indians. We have Chicanos. They're not just Mexicans. You, know? you have uh, women with new words. I'm Ms. You know? So that's, movements are very powerful things. And it educated this country. And so we made a little bit of progress, screaming all the time <laughs> to people a little more civil now. The country's a little more tolerant. It's a little more inclusive than it was. That's the change, okay? We no longer have segregation, Jim Crow, legalized. I can go back to my birth home now and ride and sit on the bus anywhere I want to. You know, I can sit down in a restaurant and have a cup of coffee, but it's never been about hamburgers. <laughs> it's never been about a cup of coffee. It's about an unshared power relationship. Nothing else. Nothing else. <laughs> Power needs to be shared. Some people have too much, 
Others have too little. Slaves have too little. Jefferson didn't have too much. <laughs> and since I create that wealth, I deserve some of it. That's what I think. You know, that, what I just said would drive 90% of American people mad, including some black people. Because somehow the truth got lost under all this race, black, white, foolishness. Let me tell you what I think about race. I think it's the greatest myth ever perpetrated on the human mind. This modern thing we call race, which people didn't belong to before. There had always been peoplehood, you know, people, consciousness of kind. I'm going to be like people who are more like you. Was but what it wasn't because of your color. It was because of your culture. It was called the real meaning of being human is inside of people. It's not the way they look. This is like a shell. It's like looking at a car. The real meaning of an automobile is a combustion engine. It's no, not the way it looks. And so what makes people people is their experience, and that's called history and culture. And that's made those three things you can't separate, history, culture, and biology. Biology is a first fact, <laughs> but it's not the most important fact. The most important fact is people create, and whatever they create through time and space adds up to who they are, their language, their customs, their habits, their mores, and so forth. So there's no black language, there's no white language, this is nonsense, there's no yellow language. <laughs> there are languages, and people know this, the academics know this. I don't want, want I, the people who I'm really mad at <laughs> are academics who know this stuff and won't help the people get well. Won't tell, look, everybody makes mistakes. Jefferson and those guys, they wanted to get power and so when they did whatever was necessary, like any political movement. You do whatever you can do, you know, the art of the possible to make it happen, says Machiavelli. You use anything, anything like a sponge. And so race was a very important thing to do at that time in order to gain access, maintain power. You know, we know that's a myth now. I know that I'm not born with good rhythm because of my black skin. You know, but people uh, believe that, you know. And I know that white people are not inherently smarter than I am. That's stupid. I've seen too many stupid white people to believe stuff like that. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, it's just it's crazy. You're gonna, uh, so we've made some progress. That's the progress that we've done. We can talk a little better. You know, there are black people in spaces and places where they've never been before. Couldn't even imagine. I'm one of them. I couldn't imagine I would be in the role of a professor at a small white on white liberal arts college in the Midwest. I mean, that's it. The movement created those opportunities for me and everybody else. For me and white women and other ethnic groups and for these new people who are coming here where they had to reform the civil rights movement, forced the reformation of the immigration laws. That's why you see all these colored people here. Because they changed the immigration laws in 1965. In 19 Twenty-four, the law said that no African Negro, no, I get that, African Negro could become an American citizen. That's what, see. The thing with Asians wasn't squared up, really, uh, squared up with Japanese and eight, uh, Chinese in 1952 when the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed. But it's still, I mean, Japanese were hanging in midair, you know. Um, here we go. The laws, you know, East Indians were... Up until 65, only 100 of them could come into this country legally, East Indians. Now they're all over the place, and, and that's fine. And incidentally, they own 53% of all the motels in America because they've had the opportunity. You know. But it has to do with black people's struggle. <laughs> this struggle impacts on everybody's life in this country, just like slavery impacted on everybody's life, whether you're in Georgia or New York, whether you were in Natchez, Mississippi, or Newport, Rhode Island, you were tied to slavery. <laughs> you know, slaves were under the gun, under the South, but the people in the North, the ones who made all the real money of the shipping industry, the torture-making instruments, God, all of the tertiary industries that were developed from slavery, you can't, I can't name them all, you know. And they weren't in the South. <laughs> the transportation system wasn't just, just in the South. The shipping industry was not controlled by the South. The rum was not a northern phenomenon, which are to its 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 its, uh, its its power, its its wealth, and sugar, and so. Yes, 
a lot of things have changed, and then again, nothing has changed. As long as white supremacy remains the mother tongue of this country, you can't change really race relations until you have some moral courage, a president or somebody, or a great priest or somebody who can be listened to, to take the risk to try to save the soul of this country and say, look, some mistakes have been made. But we're not God. <laughs> Jefferson, Washington, those guys, we're not demigods. They said so themselves. Thomas, uh, Washington warned the country. You know, America, look, people, the, the Constitution is imperfect. There are going to be people who are wiser, more inspired, better prepared than we. We're not the be-all and end-all of this thing we wrote for our time and context. And of course, Thomas Jefferson forewarned us about the troubles we would see when he said that I believe that slavery is an exercise of the most boisterous passions of unremitting despotism on the one hand and degrading submissions on the other. It teaches white children to be tyrants after the pattern of their parents. It destroys the will to work in white men. And above all, it robs man of God's greatest gift. And that is the gift of liberty. Well, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. It's like he was presaging the civil rights movement. So this guy, whatever goes up must come down. That's the one thing that they fear. They knew that, you know, and they never handle it. And no administration, no generation of American leaders, they've been faced with the same question that Jefferson and those who faced it in 1787 when they wrote the Constitution. Incidentally, written with the word not even a pen, and the slave was replaced by the euphemism persons up until after they had to put it in there the 13th Amendment, they had to use the word slave, but it was never used. See, that's silence, Joseph uh, Ellis. That's the silence. Don't say it. Look the other way. Don't see it. Don't acknowledge it. We're still doing that. I know America. As sophisticated as Americans think they are, and this is that sophistication really means deception. That's what the Greeks said. <laughs> it's not a nice word. He was deceiving somebody. And Americans are very sophisticated at that. I don't see it. I don't hear it very sophisticated, very practiced at lying to themselves. They're saying the race problem, the source of it is black people, nonsense and lie. The source of it is white people. Again, Frederick Douglass, who has to be one of the four or five wisest men of the 19th century, said that, 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 that the American people he has to understand that there's no Negro problem. There is no Negro problem. The problem is whether or not the American people have honor enough, courage enough, patriotism enough to obey their own constitution. That's the problem. If you get the president and others to obey the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and all of those things, uh, extensions of that, certainly racism wouldn't disappear, but it would modify it to a large extent. If you had leaders who said to white people, look, hey man, we got away with something. Uh, you belong to a privileged caste. Caste, C-S-T-E. Almost like in India. You know? And it's a color caste system. It's not religious. It's not based on uh, your occupation like they have in Japan and other places. It is something having to do with people being either Negro or white, and that's defined by law because people are not really born into races, you understand. They're assigned to races. I could look any way I want to look and be assigned to race. You could be assigned to the black race. And you know something else? You know, this drive you crazy. Somebody like me could be assigned to the white race, you see. How could that be? People with power can do anything. No less than 10 years ago, a man, my very complexion from Egypt, they tried to make him white, and he refused. So I'm like, what, well, what does it mean? Well, you're from Egypt, antiquity, civilization, you know, the cradle of civilization, where the Greeks got their knowledge from. So we just let you be white. And he said, no. <laughs> That's what race is. It's false consciousness. It's a fiction. 
it has no real, now they tell us, no biological reality. I can figure that out without the scientists telling me that because I can, all I have to do is look at black people. Who are black people? That's an experience to me. It's not a look, it's an experience because black Americans look like everybody <laughs> on the planet. They have every look of a so-called race, whether you're talking about white or Chinese or Indian or whatever you say. What is that? Now, I accept the fact of black so long as it's related to an experience called peoplehood. You know, I'm with that. But I don't accept it biologically. There is no black race any more than there is any white race. I would dare any human being on this planet, I don't care how bright they are or where they've been, to prove to me that they are white. If you try, you're going to open a can of worms. <laughs> you prove to me that you're white. Like I'm saying, what do you mean? What's the standard? What's the criteria? How many genes make up whiteness, you know? What, what are you saying? <laughs> what are you talking about? Don't know. People have never thought about it, you know? There ain't no white race. There's no black race, as in some set of uh, genetic codes that's fixed in nature that doesn't change and so forth and causes me to walk this way or talk this way or, or, or uh, do all of these things that I do uh, celebrating football the way we do. I mean, people racialize. That's culture. And because people don't want to acknowledge that black people have this powerful, charismatic, intangible culture. This is what this is. This is what drives Americans. What America's called culture is black culture. See? But it's not called black culture. <laughs> because we're not authentic human beings in the eyes of the white supremacists. That's the problem. It's always been the problem, it's going to be the problem, until and unless there are some people in leadership roles who have to be white with moral courage to say this is wrong, always has been wrong. This has been unfair and we've had an unfair advantage. And we have never been in a fair fight with black people. That's nonsense. And so that's my answer. You know, I don't, you know, I don't want to go particular. Oprah Winfrey, love her, good for her, talented, should be 10 of them. If you had to live in an open society, there'd been 10 or 15 Oprah Winfrey. But, you know, so I'm not vibing with that. I mean, I, I think Oprah is a better woman than I took her for. But I'm saying, you know, there ain't no big thing. That doesn't change anything structurally, institutionally. That doesn't drive our employment rate down. That doesn't create more opportunities for black people at the ground level. <laughs> that doesn't help us fight. Uh, these meannesses that, that are just enslaving us all again, that we don't, we're not responsible for the drug trade, the poor drug trade. We don't know where this comes from. You know, we don't know. Is it a green monkey in Africa starting AIDS? I question that. <laughs> I just said that. Mm -hmm. What's the next question? Okay. Where did, and I suppose you could use that word when people, you know, ask the question. You know, why are you doing what you're doing? Of course, you know, my only answer that I know of is that, that, that uh, I didn't really choose to do what I'm doing. I was chosen by the movement. That's, I mean, people are, you know, I'm not trying to be religious or anything, but it, this is what happened to me and so many others. I'm an accidental academic. This is no design. What I teach and what I studied was not in, in academia. <laughs> and the people before me and before the people before me all were committed to understanding history in a different way. And exactly how it happened, I don't know. I don't have any epiphany where one day I said I was going to try to understand history and so forth. It was just there. And I've been dealing with this since I reached the age of reason, whatever that is. <laughs> You know, I mean, reading newspapers and so on when, when I was like eight, nine years old, even younger, I don't even know. And uh, gathering a lot of information, not knowledge, uh, about the other side, the flip side of American history, and that's about one of the flip sides. You know, the flip side is Native American history. You can flip that one too. But uh, so that's another story. <laughs> I'm talking a story that I know a little bit about. Uh, the, so, um, uh, the fact that I have been around people, now with hindsight I can say it's exposed to people who, who committed their lives to social justice, uh, uh, to fighting for democracy and so forth. Obviously I didn't know all of this when it was happening. You evolve into this and then the civil rights movement surfaced in the time and context when I was coming into some sort of uh, 
identity of my own and understanding values were crystallizing around what was happening. You know, what I'm a witness, you know, the Rosa Parks, the, the sit-in movements, the wait-ins, the break-ins, the God knows what ends, and all of the civil rights activity and all of these brave, brave people who fought and died, the Fannie Lou Hamers and the, and the, and the Kwame Torres and some amenities are still alive, and the Bob Moses and the Helen on the Holmes Norton and, and, and uh, 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 Joanne Robinson and, and, and uh, the great E.D. Nixon who organized the Montgomery Boys Boycott and pushed Martin Luther King in the front of it. Uh, ordinary everyday people, I, I'm not mentioning the leaders so much, everybody knows everybody, you know, Malcolm and Martin and so forth, the triumph, and Medgar, the triumph. But I, this thing was driven by Martin calling him tramp, 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 and marching feet. Those are my heroes. I mean, I, there's no doubt about it. That, that was very inspirational to me. To see these people who were seen at, at the very bottom of society being inspired to do something for themselves, and boy, they did do it. And all that genius came for them, the political leadership, the, the eloquence, the ability to organize themselves you know, in Montgomery and in Mississippi and in Alabama, and then finally turn the Negroes in the North on to what really was happening. He thought he was free because he was riding in the front of the bus. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. And they said people can be duped. And they raised the question. And so I was trapped by that. And in fact, I would say I was doomed. I couldn't get out of it. I mean, I put aside everything, graduate school and so forth. That became insignificant to me. <laughs> Nothing was more important than the question of social justice. And so how I got here, I'm saying that I didn't decide one day like you decide you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, and so forth. That's not how I came about this. this it, I was chosen by impersonal, historical, social forces that I didn't even understand. But I knew it was right um, for me to do what I write. So I haven't lost anything, I don't think. It's been good. I've met people who I normally would not have ever met. I've traveled in places where I would never travel. So so this isn't a plan thing. I'm, I'm in motion. I'm like a jazz player. I'm improvisational like hell. <laughs> I'm Coltrane and music and all that mixed together. That's a lot the way I see life. You know, I'm not, you know, and I know I live in the wrong age to talk like this, you know, but I think, I don't think you can plan everything to a T. <laughs> I think you should plan. <laughs> But not to a T. <laughs> not a lot. You can do that in a scientific laboratory, but not in human life. Human beings are too complex for that. You just have a feeling about things, and you do it, and you try it. And if you think it, you know, think it careful enough, and then try it. So, I, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, is not because um, I was walking down the street one day, and, you know, um, Somebody said, oh, there's segregation and racism in the world, and some man told me. And I got an epiphany, and I said, oh, got to try, you know. No, it happened. Gradually, uncertainly built up to this period where you thought, I was always this way. I was always in it. No, I have not always been this way. You know, I didn't always think exactly this way. Somebody taught me, and I suppose people in the movement, as they taught America, they taught me too. The difference between me and America is that I, I acknowledge it. <laughs> that I was taught by Fannie, Fannie Lou Hamer. I was taught uh, by, the, by the death of Samuel Young, who survived Vietnam but couldn't survive Alabama. Shot in the face, in the back rather. The face with the coward would never do that <laughs> for using a bathroom at a gas station. You know, that's who taught me. I think the way I think, feel the way I feel. John Kennedy taught me something. When I, Almost, I mean, I was almost a cynic. <laughs> you know, like, wow, not skeptical until he made his civil rights speech in 1963. Well, I should have said what I'm saying. You know, look, look, guys, let's come to grips with this. He's talking to white America, not to black people. He's got no business in the conversation. We don't have any power. We can't change it. We don't make laws, rules. We don't have it. We don't have, you know, the, the, the kind of cultural base that white people have that teach them to be racist. We don't have that. 
So he was saying, you know, what are we about? We have to make up our mind. We're for de democracy, for freedom, all over the world, and we mean it, and we care about it. And well, we just say this for everybody in the world, but Negroes in America? What kind of foolishness is that? That speech is suppressed. Silence. Nobody knows John Kennedy's speech. The greatest speech ever made on behalf of humans and civil rights by a president. I'm talking about Lincoln, too. It's made by John F. Kennedy. Do I think John F. Kennedy is a great guy? And so and then, well, he was a very bright man, unusually bright to be president, really. <laughs> I mean, you know, they have too many bright people. President, but he's, he's unique. I mean, he's back to the early guys like Jefferson. Now. Racist though they were, racist though Madison and those were, they were very bright people. There's no question about that. And Kennedy is, is, is connected to them as well as anybody uh, in, in modern times. I'm not a, 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 a fan of any American political leader. I want to make that crystal clear. They got to do something, you know, in, in my eyes, spectacularly unracist <laughs> to impress me. So I can't be impressed. I'm sure because nobody's going to assert us like that. But but I was an admirer of Kennedy. But I had to change my mind. Well, he's a better man than I took him for. He said, had the courage to say that and had no civil rights background like Humphrey. That should have been the speech Humphrey made. <laughs> you know, he had the reputation, the background, you know, the, the endearment uh, from African people. He, you know, they loved him. Humphrey, you know, they, Kennedy had to earn their endearment. <laughs> yeah, you know. And um, the hard way, or the quick way, however he did it, but he did that when he talked about it. And he used the word moral in the speech. That's a no-no for any American politician. Nothing is moral. It's always political, and it functions around power. Don't deal with the word morality, because we're all Machiavellians. And Machiavellians say, you know, the question is how you run the state successfully, how you gain, maintain, access power. There are no morals in politics, the man said, and they've learned that lesson pretty good. So I'm here because I'm here. And I'm here because I believe in the ideals of democracy. I do what I do because I, I think this country has possibilities. Uh, probabilities? <laughs> That's tougher to say. But possibilities, you know, you, you meant, you've got to dream or uh, you finish. You know, uh, like since this whole fast of dreams where dreams die, life is like a broken winged word that cannot fly. So there's a dream in this land with its back against the world to save the dream for one. It must be saved for all. To save the dream for one. It must be saved for all. That's what I believe. I believe I want an open and free society. I want it so that when I see you walking down the street, you really won't be a white person. You'll be a person, of course. <laughs> but your skin color won't mean any more than your hair. Or whatever, you know. I think that's possible. Not probable, but I'm saying it's probable. And you see me, you know, with my deeply hued melanin skin, and you just see some man, run, run, you know, this funny looking animal, uh, like we all are who stand erect, funny looking to the rest of the animal kingdom. I'm sure that if animals could talk, they would, they would, you know, they would just be laughing and talking. Look at that weird thing walking down the street. Look at him. Two legs standing straight up. That, and I have thought about that myself. I'm saying that's funny looking. When you think about it, <laughs> your people are funny looking because they walk erect, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> but if if we could come to that point, you know, it would mean any more than the color of your eyes, you know, skin, you know and, and so forth. Uh, that's what I want to see. Possible, but improbable, because <laughs> everything's possible. Everything that I can see bro. it's possible in my mind so that's where I'm at on that tip you know I'm, I'm, I'm saying that yeah thing every <laughs> the more things change the more they remain the same everything's changed yet nothing is same when well, we've changed we've changed fundamentally relatively but not fundamentally mm -hmm. superficially broadly but not with any depth the same questions that were here in 1787 are here now, now I don't, I, you know, stop on. I said I talk about what I want to talk about, but I've also looked at the Native American people and what's happening there, you know, and that's that's a 
different story, but it's intrinsically related to black people's story. It's a connection between land and labor which brought makes Indians and black people unique in that the, the, the conquest and, and greed for native land and then the search for a source of cheap labor which married us to Native American land and that's the greatest story never told. It's a connection between black people and Native Americans over land, over the American land. And so the question is a legitimate one. It's a question of sovereignty, a question of land, and not just civil rights. Mm -hmm. It's not a Native American question. And we are land alienated people, you know, unique in the world. Mm -hmm. Land alienated. You can't claim your homeland. We do, in spite of the world. And Africans don't know what to do about it because they have been disoriented by colonialism and imperialism, which is another form of slavery. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, too. So I don't make any great distinction between colonialism, imperialism, and our enslavement, except that it has the depth of our deformation is greater than it happened in Africa because of you know stuff like language, uh, which is uh, the real meaning of life. <laughs> so, so it's language. It's a word. Everything comes back to a question of speech. Everything. I think Henry, Henry James was right. That's what it is. That's what makes people unique again in a very powerful way. Is the magic of the spoken word. That's what Hitler thought. And he was right. He yeah, was evil. He made evil use of it. He was right. And the magic of the spoken word. What created Negroes and white people? Stuff that doesn't even exist. It's just like creating, you know, ghosts, incubi, mm -hmm. <laughs> possessions. You know, all these things don't exist but you got the word for it. So the assumption is that they do exist. Mm -hmm. So you could say something with words, and that's the power. You know, everything begins with the word. Boom. Uh, the power of the spoken word, especially, when it's spoken, is awesome. It's awesome when, when people master the, you know, the oratorical skills or whatever. <laughs> Much more powerful than writing. And uh, all demagogues know that, you know, <laughs> that's tough, you know, that's mm -hmm. why they go so far. Uh, but I think if American people stop admiring this most effective liars, uh, they're going to be growing up. H.L. Mencken said that this is who American people admire the most in public life, are, are liars, effective liars. He said that, you know, um, a, 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 a an, an honest and honorable man has no more chance of becoming the president of the United States than Galileo had to becoming the Pope of Rome. So it's, 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 it's not much of a chance there. Yeah. <laughs> H.L. Mencken, I, I, you know, I always use quote white people uh, because, again, being black, I'm not authentic. So I, the word can't come from me. So what do I say? White people. And it makes things a whole different tone. So I don't use my quotes. <laughs> use white people. This kind of, and then he said, oh, Mencken said that. Oh, but if I had said that, so oh, you just don't like white people and you're racist. And, oh, nonsense like that. People trying to get at the truth, they bring that phony stuff up. Mm -hmm. This is Then I'll just ask the three questions as we go, if that's okay. Uh, Unless you want to just go 